Hello! Um, in this lesson, we are going to look at two ideas from John Mackey's book, Inventing Right and Wrong. The first is the argument from queerness, and the second is his error theory, and the two are very closely related. In Inventing Right and Wrong, John Mackey is pushing um, a moral irrealist position. In other words, he is saying that uh, all our moral judgments are essentially subjective. So in this sense, he is similar to um, A.J. Eyre and his theory of emotivism and Richard Hare's theory of prescriptivism. However, the way in which he argues for a moral irrealist conclusion is somewhat different. OK, and so that's what we're going to be looking at in this lesson. So to begin with, let's get clear about some terminology. OK, um, Mackey uses the terms first order claim and second order claim in his book. Now, a first order claim is essentially a normative claim. In other words, it's a claim about what is right and wrong. For example, abortion is wrong. It's a normative claim. All right. A second order claim, by contrast, is a meta ethical claim. So, for example, you might claim that moral value is just based on somebody's personal attitude towards an action or a situation. All right. So that is a second order claim. It's not telling you what is right and wrong like a first order claim. It's just telling you uh, about the nature of a moral judgment or making a claim about it. All right. Um, so it's important, although this um, terminology is somewhat different and although Mackey is, is essentially saying that first order claims are normative claims and second order claims are meta ethical claims, it is important to use this terminology when you're talking about Mackey's book um, and making sure that you can explain it as I just have. So Mackey as I've said, is a moral irrealist, which means he doesn't believe that um, there are any moral facts. All right. However, unlike um, A.J. Ayer's emotivism, Mackey does believe that there can be morally objective standards insofar as they can be derived from an agreed standard of judgment or an agreed framework. So, for example, you know, societies have agreed frameworks as what counts as right and wrong okay those frameworks themselves are obviously sets of rules they're not based on moral facts okay so it's still subjective but within that society you have a series of rules um, that you can appeal to when trying to show whether something is right or wrong and Mackey to demonstrate this uses an example of um, a sheepdog herding sheep in a sheepdog trial. Right? Um, and he gives the example that um, we've got a sheepdog who scatters sheep all over a field. But nonetheless, the judges give it the prize for best sheepdog. However, if they do that, they will have made an unjust decision. All right? So you have a set of standards that determines whether a sheepdog is good or bad. And then you have to make a judgment in relation to that. OK, um, and if you judge um, that the sheepdog is good, even though um, it has proved to be absolutely terrible, uh, then you've made an unjust decision against the sheepdog. All right. However, and this is Mackey's point, it is still an open question as to whether there is an objective moral requirement to judge justly. Or to refrain from judging unjustly. All right. Um, and he doesn't believe that there is such an objective requirement. And so ultimately, um, there is not a realm of moral facts. OK, there is no objective moral value. Um, and so to augment this argument, to kind of deepen it uh, and to strengthen it, um, he develops what is called the argument from queerness. And he suggests that moral values would have to be queer or strange forms of entity because knowledge of them would also have to give the agent the motivation to act. OK, um, 
a good way of putting this might be to imagine that you have six beers in the fridge. All right. Um, and this is just a fact. There are six bottles of beer in the fridge. Um, that only becomes um, something relevant if you are thirsty or you want a beer. OK, so the motivation for you to go and get a beer is subjective. That part is down to you. There is nothing in the fact of there being six beers in the fridge itself. Right. That um, motivates you to go and get a beer from the fridge. That motivation is entirely subjective. And similarly, Mackie says um, that the natural features of a situation, the facts themselves, are not motivate they don't contain any kind of motivation if they did that would have to be a very strange kind of thing all right so imagine i don't know you witness a theft all right um, and you think it's wrong and you want to go and intervene there is nothing in the theft itself all right that contains that motivation okay the motivation comes from you from your response to the theft all right and so Mackie's saying that if object if there really was um, an objective moral truth in this kind of case for example that stealing is wrong um, that that objectivity would have to be actually tied up in the facts itself or in the actions themselves and when we observe um, such things we don't see that all right um, so they would have to be very queer kinds of entity. Moral motivations would have to be tied up in the fact themselves, and they would have they would need to be very strange kinds of entity um, in order to motivate. They would have to sort of contain motivation in themselves. All right, and he says that this is a very strange idea. It's pretty incoherent. It's far better and more sensible and simple to suggest that the motivation comes from you rather than the facts themselves okay and that shows that morality is ultimately subjective in other words um, that irrealism moral irrealism is true all right so he asked this question what objects in the world have moral motivation built into them the answer is that you can't find one all right and this shows morality to be subjective it's worth mentioning at this point um, a, a formula, if you like, known as Occam's Razor. And this was developed by um, the philosopher William of Occam, uh, who lived uh, near Ripley in Surrey. OK, actually in a little village called Occam that is next to Ripley. Um, and he basically made the claim that you should never um, multiply entities beyond necessity. In other words, if you have two competing theories to explain the same thing, choose the theory with the fewest number of complications or the fewest number of steps, because uh, that really reduces the risk of making an error. OK, the more complications that you have in an explanation, the more likely it is that one or two of them are wrong. OK, and so Mackey actually appeals to Occam's razor in this respect. Um, he says, look, you've either got to suggest that there are these queer moral entities that exist in the facts themselves and that requires quite a complex theory um, or you just accept that there are no moral facts and that your moral motivations come from within you okay so they are subjective and irrealist okay so it's simpler to suppose that ultimately moral action is a subjective response even if it is contextualized within a culture with agreed standards. OK, so Mackey rejects a model of objectivity um, that suggests moral value exists in the fabric of the universe. All right. He thinks it is false um, to think of the think of um, moral judgments in a realist sense. All right. So that is essentially um, Mackey's argument from queerness, and he uses it to try to show uh, that um, moral irrealism is the most sensible theory to adopt, that morality is ultimately subjective.
This is closely related to what he calls his error theory. All right. Now, moral properties like rightness and wrongness, obligation, justice, and so on, he thinks are merely psychological or societal inventions. All right. So, for example, when we're in college or school, we all have lan lanyards displaying our names, all right? And these names are attached to us. And Mackie kind of takes this model of language. He says, look, pretty much all of language functions in a way where you have names attached to objects. So, for example, if I say the um, lampshade is red, I'm attaching the term red to the lampshade. Um, and that is independently verifiable if I get other people to come in and look at it. All right. So the lampshade is red is a fact. All right. That can be independently verified. All right. So the idea is that we associate a person with a particular name or associate an object with a particular color. And this is a form of identification. All right. So it's an idea that language functions in terms of labels being attached to things. All right. And this gives us sort of facts. Um, but M Mackie says that we also do this in relation to moral claims, and this is where we make a mistake. Okay, this is where we fall into error, hence the name error theory. So let's compare the statement racism is wrong with this person is Tom, or perhaps this lampshade is red. In terms of racism is wrong, all right, we may all agree um, that racism is unpleasant and something that should be eliminated as soon as possible, right? But we can't actually independently verify that as a fact, all right? It's just something that we may all agree on, but it's not actually a fact in the world that can be verified or falsified, i.e. shown to be true or false. Whereas the lampshade is red, can be shown to be true or false um, if the lampshade is either red or not okay similarly this person is tom right can be shown to be true or false depending on i don't know the name in tom's passport and on his birth birth certificate and so on okay so mackie thinks that um language makes it look like we're doing the same thing okay in each case um, racism is wrong. We're, we're dressing up to look like a fact in the same way as the lampshade is red um, is a fact or this person is Tom is a fact, assuming those things are true. OK, but we can't say um, that racism is wrong is true or false in the same way. Or Mackie thinks that we can't say um, that it's true or false at all. All right. And so he thinks we fall into error. OK, so. Unlike names and facts, there are no moral features in the external world to which our moral words, for example, right, wrong, righteous and shameful and so on, correspond. All right. Um, so we can't in the same way think of it in terms of a label attached to a particular thing and that that can be independently shown to be true or false. So our moral judgments about right and wrong fail to capture the moral dimensions of things because there aren't any all right there aren't any actual moral facts in the fabric of the universe okay and so this is where Mackie thinks we make an error okay that's why he calls it error theory so we fall into error when we use moral terms we think we are doing something that we are not we think we are making true statements but w really we are making false statements, all right? So no moral facts exist with which moral facts or moral ideas can correspond. So we make an error. So some people take this to be quite a convincing argument, but there are, I think, a couple of objections that you can make specific to this argument, all right? The first is that in order to make a false claim in relation to something it must be possible to make a true claim in relation to it also so for example in mathematics um, 2 plus 2 equals 7 is false because the possibility of truth exists also we can work out that 2 plus 2 
equals 4. All right? So it's, impo it's possible for anyone to have that independently verified. All right? Similarly, the sun is cold, all right, is false, because it's possible to prove it otherwise through simple observation. But that is, Mackey's saying um, that moral statements are false because you can't prove it either way. However, this is the, this is the fundamental aspect of the objection. Right? If you cannot say in principle that something is true, then you can't say in principle that it is false either. Okay, So if it is not possible for a claim to be true, such as giving to charity is right... It is not possible for it to be false either. And so it makes no sense for Mackey to say that moral claims are false if at the same time he's saying that it is not possible for them to be true. All right. So his argument, you could say, is incoherent. It assumes falsity where there is no possibility of having truth. OK. Another objection um, is that Mackey's position may need to lead to moral nihilism. Now, moral nihilism, also known as ethical nihilism, is the meta-ethical view that nothing is morally right or wrong. There is no morality. OK, comes from the Latin word nihil, meaning nothing. OK, um, so if you're a moral nihilist, you do not believe that you can speak about right or wrong in any way. You think that morality is essentially dead. OK. And it's important, to obviously, to realise that um, moral nihilism is distinct from what is known as moral relativism. OK. Um, now, moral relativism is something that perhaps Mackey would allow for. OK. That allows for actions to be um, right or wrong relative to a particular culture or society okay um, so we can think about uh, the rules uh, the sheepdog trial example again all right uh, there are certain standards that we invent okay um, that can then act as a kind of guide to say this is right or wrong but of course in the end whether we enact those standards or not is entirely a subjective judgment all right so there is a little difference there between relativism and nihilism, although, uh, whereas nihilism said there's no such thing as morality at all, all right, uh, relativism is the idea that you've got competing moral systems, all of which are subjective, um, but at least they provide uh, societal frameworks. All right. So think about this question as a sort of discussion question. Is moral nihilism true? Uh, or do you think that uh, we, sh we do have a sense of morality even though it is subjective. All right. Um, that's all for now um, in terms of Mackey. Uh, obviously, it would be really beneficial now if you look at the other two uh, meta-ethical theories um, that I've made videos for. Uh, that is A.J. Ayer's emotivism and uh, Richard Hare's prescriptivism and see how they compare. Okay. That's the end of this video.